And call the city and see if we can get our stuff removed. It's been about two years now. Well, how many times have you called them? Well, including just recently, three or four times. Yeah. And so I don't. Maybe one of these states has been there. Uh, five through eight. The ending of first Zechariah or whatever. We're starting with the flying scroll. Yeah. <laughs> We're finishing finishing the visions and the going into war. <laughs> the long sermon. <laughs> or whatever what he calls a sermon. That's kind of that's a sermon. So. Did you get these? Yeah. No, you had them on the counter. I just had them by your Bible. <laughs> So I won't be reading anything. Uh-oh. <laughs> but he got the ice cream, hey. <laughs> okay. Well, Larry won't be here. He's babysitting. And, uh, and Mary Donna won't be. won't be here. I don't know why. She just said oh. she wouldn't. Mary won't be. Mary won't be here. Mary's in a terrible cold. I called her on the phone oh, okay. and she spoke and I said, what, what happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But she... Been to the doctor and he gave her medication. She said, I feel a lot better today. Good. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, I went again. They gave me another round of medicine and this time it's inhaler. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, yeah, I don't like the inhaler. Does it make you antsy? No, it makes me horrible. Oh. <laughs> but I had to have the lungs clear to have the surgery. In your shoulder. Yes, yes, for sure. Gosh, when is that going to be? January 9th. Oh, coming up real soon. Yeah, yeah. Write that down. Where are you going to have this done at? Uh, Riverside. Letty did this shoulder. He'll do this. Orthopedic one. I told him after three surgeries, the fourth one should be free. Is that an application thing or will you? Uh, they said, well, the last time I, they kept me overnight, he said they've come up with a much better block mm. that lasts a couple of days. Mm. So they're trying to send oh, everybody home. That's good news. Yeah. yeah. Gonna, for David. We're gonna have to get another knee done again. <laughs> Who do you go to? Big shame. Okay, and I went to Shaha. Yeah. I'll be going in there for that too. Oh, yes. One is 25 years Oh. I've already replaced one the second time. I knew that. Yeah. So you've gotten good mileage out of it. Yeah. Good mileage. <laughs> I tweaked this one playing golf years ago. And so I ended up, well, it wow. hurt me. One and I ended up going to that, your doctor. So hi. Yeah. Did you like him? Yeah. And he x-rayed it and looked. He said, yeah, he said, your your knees are in good shape. He said, you got plenty of whatever you're supposed to have in there. And he, but he said, yeah, you tweaked it. He said, I'll give you a shot of quarter. And then he threw quite a bit of fluid off of it, too. Yeah, yeah, quite a bit of fluid in there. Is Roger here? He's coming. Oh, okay. You left him out in the cold? <laughs> <laughs> he was like, so ready to come in Maybe here. she left him in the car. <laughs> Roger better be here because Roger better be here because what we talked about. Ice cream, you know, oh, Roger. He, oh. <laughs> his bedtime snack on. As David's drinking hot chocolate. <laughs> that even sounds good, David. Uh, warm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's hot. <laughs> it was 26th, not 20, mm -hmm. Yeah. That was a yeah, we Bill commented on the temperature as we were driving past a car that had the back window down so the dog had a big old woolly dog hanging out the window. And I said, I'm sorry, buddy, but at 28 degrees. You're, you're not putting your head down. Uh, I told Owen to put on his gloves this morning. He said, Why? Because <laughs> it's cold. He said, I don't want to. <laughs> Our youngest grandson still goes out in shorts. I, said, I noticed he today he had dogs. No, he had donkey things. Okay. Yeah. I said, Your hands are going to freeze. You're putting on your gloves. And then he got this sad look on his face. Oh. 
that means it's going to be inside I recess. <laughs> and believe me, the teacher's going, oh, yeah. yeah. Like whether you put the gloves on or not, it's not going to affect. The actual temperature of the wind is what determines that. Was standing outside and that lunch day. duty one time, and the principal came up and he said, "So, and, oh, there he, is. he says, so when, so when did, uh, when did we pass the point of cool to uh, uh, comfortable?" I said, "I don't know, but I, I passed it." <laughs> Then the Boy Scouts oh. came in here in short time. Did they tonight? I did. I, did. I turned on the heat. <laughs> <laughs> Our neighbors will be out taking their dogs out at night in shorts. Oh, uh, uh, usually, we just talk in shorts. Oh, and how the is to be probably. <laughs> so we had a neighbor. <laughs> You to still walk. I'm going to Don't you do a lot of walking? And and you still walk? Yeah. No. No. I have to wait two hours. Oh, that's what stopped me. Carol, I think last week. What are these? And I don't want to have a mic in there. I don't know why. I don't know why. I don't know why. I Hi, Beth. Hi, Beth. Kate's sister's in the world. Hi, Beth. She's sister's in the world. I don't know why I didn't find that. I took a Colorado. Beth, can you hear me? I can. Um, a church for all people is doing Christmas Eve morning and New Year's morning. The 24th and the day before. So if you're not home, I'm just telling you. If you don't want to do it, I just, I was surprised because last year we didn't do it on the 24th. Yeah, I was, I was wondering, I was going to um, see if Denise had heard anything, but I'm glad you told me. Well, we asked Sunday. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you know what I was thinking? I'm wondering if it's cold if they'll let them sleep inside, and then we would have a big crowd, you know? Um, they open it up in the winter for them to sleep in the main sanctuary. Okay. So I just but, like it we probably won't know that till closer to Christmas. Pardon? Yes. Oh no, not I didn't hear you. I said we probably won't know if we're going to have a huge crowd until closer to Christmas, depending on how cold it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, if they open the doors and let them sleep, <laughs> then they let them stay and have breakfast. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> All right. Once we're not reading it, all Okay. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so, Chris? Yes. Could I uh, mention a couple of things about the Christmas families before we get started? Yes, please. Okay. Um, Donna Gallucci called me yesterday, and they have um, a lot of Christmas decorations that they are now taking out of a storage bin. They're clearing out the bin. And in years past, sometimes we would offer families Christmas trees and decorations, and we haven't done that for a long time, but they have quite a bit of Chris, quite a few Christmas decorations, and they're wondering if any of our families would want any of that. 
I told her I would ask the group because I did not interview families and I don't know whether or not uh, any of your families are interested in that. We didn't, I didn't ask, didn't ask. Beth, yeah. Um, we took Christmas decorations down to the church for people about three years ago and they went really fast. Oh. They give them to the families who they've given an apartment or a house to. Oh, okay, so great. If you want to check with the church for all people about that, because uh, that could be a possibility as an option. Okay, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. I'll let Donna know that. Okay. Um, the other thing is that uh, when I looked at the table yesterday, we still have a little bit over 100 gifts, tags that have not been signed <clears throat> for. So I'm wondering if we could possibly reach out to those people that worship online hmm. and um, you know just encourage them to maybe stop in during the week. Uh, the table mm -hmm. and the tags are up all the time. Um, it just it seems to me that we we have a lot of tags and I know we've got two weeks left, but I'm a little concerned about the number of tags. Okay. If a family's not out, does that mean they're taken care of? They're completed. Like I did a family, I think number nine, if they're not out, does that mean all their gifts were bought? Uh, it means that everybody has signed up and okay. we've, we've put their paper in the okay. folder. Okay. We've been pulling them as we fill up a sheet. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Beth, I wonder if, if they, because it seems like there's so many families down at the end here. I wonder if you could put the tables two and two on opposite sides of the room or the opposite sides of the hall. I don't know if that's possible, but so that people can see them because I think we're getting lost with it going so long down the hall. If we could put two tables on one side and two on the other that they might see the more. And We'd have to have more workers. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll say asking. something to Denise. I don't know if that would help or not, but. Yeah. Well, and, and the newer ones have been added closer to the coffee bar. So, you know, sometimes people don't go all the way down the table. But... Might be a okay. thought. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Well, they decorated I'm yesterday. Sure so sure. are you are you thinking about opposite ends of the hallway or across from each other? I was thinking across from each other, maybe so that it's more visible and Two and two, yeah. maybe just right now we can't do that up. because they decorated and they're and yeah like they two, put up, the Christmas two tables trees. up front where they sell the subs so that right when they come in they they see it and, okay you know and make it harder to walk past it I guess is it more okay and maybe not as polite way to put it <laughs> thank you thank you Ed all righty, I'll pass that along to Denise and see what Just she says. Idea. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate we it. We could do something and we'll update the announcement to encourage people to come in and take a look if they're worshiping online. So okay. This Sunday, we have Dave and Karen uh, working the tables at 930 or the before and after the right. service. Right. Uh, and then the following Sunday, Bill and Carol, 9 to 9.30, and Kent and Terry, 10.30 to 11. And so. Great. All right. Thank, Thank you, you all. Yeah. All right. All right, let's pray. Good and gracious God, thank you again for this time to come together. We thank you for the warmth of the building as we gather here, um, the warmth of our homes gathering online. Um, the ability to come together from various parts um, of the city to be together. We pray that you would bless our time together in our conversation as we study your word, open our hearts and our minds, and let your spirit move amongst us to help us learn more about you, oh God, and to grow closer to you and closer to each other in Christian fellowship and love. We praise you, and we lift all these things up to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Uh, we are on chapter five of Zechariah. Um, so we've had 
several visions now. Um, and we are on to the sixth vision um, or fifth, depending on how you're counting. Um, and that's in chapter five here. So would somebody read for us this vision of the flying scroll verses one through very quickly, one through four. Then I lifted up my eyes again and looked, and behold, there was a flying scroll. And he said to me, what do you see? And I answered, I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits, and its width is 10 cubits. Then he said to me, this is the curse that is going forth over the face of the whole land. Surely everyone who steals will be purged away according to the writing on one side, and everyone who swears will be purged away according to the writing on the other side. I will make it go forth, declares the Lord of hosts, and it will enter the house of the thief and the house of the one who swears falsely by my name, and it will spend the night within that house and consume it with its timber and stone. Thank you. So this is the, the next vision that Zechariah sees after the vision of the lampstand that we talked about last, the end of our time last week. Um, and uh, I'm just curious, I mean, with these visions, you know, they're not very cut and dry. And so um, I'm curious what other people's interpretation is. I mean, I have, you know, I have commentaries, some people have commentaries, but maybe, you know, the Holy Spirit is telling you hey, this is what this means, you know, and, and we can share with one another. And it's not to say that one person's is right or the other one's is wrong, but we all learn more when we share with each other. So I'm curious to know uh, what others got out of this vision. Not much. Not much. You know, you know, the house of the house. Not much. much. I'm sorry. She asked what I said. I just. That's right. Wait. Um, could you say again, Roger? It's just a different reading. Yours is King James, is that right? No, New American Standard. This is a New International. So, <clears throat> uh, verse four: The Lord Almighty declares, "I will send it out. It will enter the house of the thief." The house of him who swears falsely by my name, it will remain in his house and destroy it and its timbers and his stones. Mm -hmm. So I got kind of lost there in the reading of the King James. He was a reading. Huh? It's not King James. It's New American standard. New American. I'm sorry. <laughs> New American. <laughs> so, what did the King James say? <laughs> It says pretty much the others, with, with some exceptions. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill was reading in chapter three, or verse three, I'm sorry. This is a curse that go forth over the face of the whole earth, for everyone that steals shall be cut off, as on this side, according to it, and everyone that sweareth shall be cut off, as at that side, according to it. So just a little bit of variance, but pretty much the same. <clears throat> but the one thing that I can't avoid, you know that, the numbers. is the numbers. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's amazing. you got to ask yourself, why does God throughout Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, has numbers just standing out there? And... So often they're divisible by five, which is God's grace. There's there's a there's an attention here for some reason, and I can't grasp it. But it, it's clear it's 20 cubits by 10 cubits. And the temple is divisible. It's 150 feet length and 75 feet in width. There's an attention all the time to make these things stand out. David's been into numbers for years. <laughs> <laughs> you who are new do not know. <laughs> and mine instead of cubits says 30 
feet long and 15 feet wide, which well, is still, 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 still. Like, mm -hmm. well, and, and, and the cubit is like the length from the elbow to the, to the hand. Hand. That's right. It's about 18 inches, a foot yeah. and a half. So if, if you did that by 20, you're still, and by 10, you still have a divisible number That's by five. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, it's throughout the Bible. That's the thing. It's, it's not like it's in one specific chapter. Literally, throughout the whole Bible, it just stands out there. And if you look, Revelations in chapter one, which you're more than aware of, there's numbers throughout chapter one. Mm -hmm. Throughout chapter one. Mm -hmm. I was, um, it says in, in uh, verse three, surely everyone who steals will be purged away according to the writing on one side. And everyone who swears, and then you get down to verse four, and it says, and everyone who swears falsely by my name. So clarify that. That's, I was, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> That's yeah, what I'm I'm because a lot, you know, a lot of times in the Bible, they repeat stuff mm -hmm. over and over and over again. And uh, so it's just interesting that he wrote, everyone who swears up here and then swears um, by my name. That, swears so, falsely. Yeah, there's an interesting, I'm trying to see if I followed this correctly, according to what he's saying. So the word they're translating as shall be cut off uh, should actually be translated as um, acquitted or held innocent as in a court of law. And the, um, so in the past tense, not shall be acquitted, but um, have been acquitted. And what he's saying is, you know, before the, uh, before the exile, when Judah was still operating, that if somebody went into a court of law and swore on oath their testimony, that that testimony was judged to be true because uh, they swore that it was. Uh, the modern day equivalent is us putting our hand on the Bible in the, in the court. You know, you swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help God. Um, and so what he's saying is people were committing crimes and then just swearing on oath they didn't do it and getting away with it if there wasn't another witness because the oath was judged to be so sacrosanct. that So they were swearing. And so he's saying... So they were perjuring themselves. That's what we right, would say in a court of law. Right, right. right. But they would be found innocent. Mm -hmm. um, and but God knows the truth, and that God is going to take this. So the scroll, I guess, represents this uh, this injustice that was rampant in. You know, I'm repeating everything that or what I'm trying to get from what he's saying. And so God is going to take the scroll and use it to. Um, uh, judge those people in their house um, and destroy their houses um, because they they did steal and they swore falsely by the name of God. So it'd be like because mm -hmm. he says um, that we should think about the fact that uh, we do this with the Bible now. Uh, oh, yeah. By the default of public practice, the Bible has come to function more or less as the scroll does in Zechariah, Zechariah 5. It is placed in position to exonerate those who testify falsely. Okay. Okay. You should think about that. So in other words, putting their hand on the Bible, saying that they're going to tell the truth, and nothing but the truth, but then they don't. It makes us, it gives us the wit or the the jury, I guess, gives the jury this false sense that what they're saying is going to be true. That makes sense. It also hasn't changed. 
No. Uh, <laughs> even though we know we know people lie, we know people lie on the stand. But I guess what he's saying is that the the Bible has come to function as some sort of a extra security measure. Oh, you know, they wouldn't they wouldn't tell they swore on the Bible to tell the truth. So that's gonna well, them, and on the yeah. other hand, I think if you were sitting in the jury and somebody swore on the Bible to tell the truth and then they got on the stand and they got caught in the middle of a lie. That's got, it, they gotta get caught in a lie. Well, that's the they thing. get caught in the middle of a the lie, then that also is a indication of their character, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. might have a lot of weight bearing on a jury mm -hmm. when it comes to a decision. I guess the difficulty is if they don't get caught. Well, they'll get in caught. lie. Well, <laughs> well, I think that's what this is saying. <laughs> yeah. I think that's what verse four is saying. They're gonna get caught. Yeah. In the end. Yeah. yeah. Maybe not here, but yeah. what's the difference between about well? What about like I swear over my grandmother's grave? It's the same thing. Yeah, it's like it's like if you were to swear on something, it it gives extra force to <clears throat> you telling the truth, I guess. I still always trust people who say I swear over my grandmother's and I used to be like your grandma. Think sometimes when you, when a person makes that statement, it's a statement of sincerity. Too, not necessarily not in a negative way, but I know in the Masons we take an oath, and I know sometimes it's not take an oath in the Bible, but I think there's a different connotation to it, but you know, I promise and swear that I will, or when somebody gets sworn into an office, do you solemnly promise and swear to do the best ability in the office to which I have been elected or appointed? And so forth. And, and I think it's a, a statement of sincerity in that respect. Is the problem though, that's all protocol. And that Bible doesn't represent the same thing to everybody. Mm -hmm. So there's probably some people who just routinely would do that without any mm -hmm. hesitation, but it truly is not a sanctimonious type thing to them. Mm -hmm. Especially now. Uh, just like in ancient Judah, there may have, there certainly were people who revered God and would take that seriously to say, I swear by God that what I'm saying is true, but for sure there were people who would get up there and take the stand or the gates, as it were, you know, wherever they held court and <laughs> would just take that oath to get out of getting in trouble. Things so they were swearing changed. falsely. Yeah, no, things haven't changed. This uh, scroll is huge. Yes. 15 feet by 30 feet. And it's flying. And it's flying. That's right. Yeah. But you know, as I was sitting there saying about it, it's a vision. Mm -hmm. So is this vision a dream? If you think of sometimes our dreams, they don't make sense, but there's a message behind it, though. Hey, you might have I come up with that. Yeah. <laughs> The other night I was doing drywall. Now, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. There you go. Well, it's a big scroll that's flying. It's, I mean, it's like saying this problem is all over the land of Judah. It's covering the whole land. <clears throat> I don't think we can leave this without going back to Dave's point on the numbers. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because uh, I've been thinking about it ever since you brought it up, and uh, it struck me as I read, particularly the Old Testament, where they lay out the dimensions of the temple and uh, uh, the tabernacles and everything's got those. I think they are ways to drive the narrative, because here, uh, we know this is big, because in our terms, uh, it's 30 by 30 by 15 feet. 
and that's a big thing written on both sides. Uh, and it's going around and it's gonna enter your house if you don't shape up and take it down every stone and so forth. So I, I see though all those numbers, I felt the same way reading about the building of the temple and all because it, it drives the nerve if you can visualize a half, right? If you've ever done any of that kind of work, you, 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 you're yearning to hear those numbers because you want to get your hands around. Well, it'd be close to the size of this room. Yeah. How, and, is it, how many names could you write on the scroll that <laughs> big? Quite a few. Yeah. As, a, as a, just a point of interest, the vestibule at the front of Solomon's temple was 20 cubits by mm -hmm. 10 cubits. Mm -hmm. And the monumental cherubim over the ark within the temple were 10 cubits high and their combined wingspan was 20 cubits. Mm -hmm. Same size. So there you go. he says scholars have sought to connect these things, um, but he doesn't see a connection. But I just thought that was an interesting thing to point out there. Those are the same dimensions. <laughs> so. Other than the number. Other than the number being divisible by five. Other than the number. And I, I, I don't want to take quite much time. I know what some of this more. But if you take one through 12, number, that's first of all, and represent and look at that, and there's two books that are out. Prophet and Prophecy, a mathematician from Canada who wanted to prove he wasn't sure about his faith. He was shaky. And so he wanted to prove one way or the other, what is the significance of numbers in the Bible? And so he went through an elaborate study and he wrote a book on prophecy and prophet. I think I shared that with you. Mm -hmm. And each one of those numbers, but first of all, they represent a triangle, and each one of those numbers is, has a valid purpose intent in Scripture. <clears throat> and he made it clear that, you know, three is God's deity, five, five is God's grace, six is the creation of mankind, the sixth day, four is the dimensions of the earth, north, south, east, and west. Uh, seven is God's complete number. Eight, which is interesting, is new beginning. And where that shows up is in the Gospel of John. If you do the, the seven signs in the Gospel of John tied to miracles, and you look for the eight, it's when Jesus rose from the dead and said to the disciples, throw your net on mm -hmm. the other side, and it caught 153 fish. If oh, you take go. each one of those numbers and apply it by divisible by three, you come up with 153. So... Didn't he call God a great mathematician? <laughs> yeah. The guy who wrote it called God the great mathematician. Well, if you count the vision of um, Joshua, the high priest... Yeah. As one of the visions, there are eight visions here in Zechariah. New beginning, what is the eight? And this is about uh, the new beginning of, uh -huh. of, uh, of Judah. The priest and the branch. Yeah. Um, well, let's let's go on to the next vision, um, the Epa, the vision of the Epa. Uh, this is in verses 5 through 11. Would somebody read for us? I will. Thank you, Roger. The woman in a basket. Then the angel who was speaking to me came forward and said to me, look up and see what this is that is appearing. I asked, what is it? He replied, it's a measuring basket. He added, this is the iniquity of the people throughout the land. Then the cover of the feed was raised and there in the basket sat a woman he said, this is wickedness. He pushed her back into the basket, pushed the head cover down over his mouth. Then I looked up, and there before me were two women with the wind in their wings. They had wings like those of stork, and they lifted up the basket between heaven and earth. What are they? 
taking, where are they taking the basket? I asked the angel who was speaking to me. He replied, to the country of Babylonia, to build a house for it. When it is ready, the basket will be set there in its place. Okay. Thank you, Roger. Um, so this is the vision of the Epha, um translated basket or container or I don't know what what is some other people's translations have. Epha here it says Epha. Does <laughs> too. Okay. Mine's basket. Uh, basket. <laughs> Uh, it probably was a basket, um, and epha was like a, a unit of measure, so like a, a sack of flour, but it was an epha of flour, and they probably used a basket, and if they had a, a um, standard measurement, a standard size, they probably had a standard size basket that was an epha, it was an epha of flour, uh, just like we would say a liter or a cup or a... Um, and so he sees an epha or a, a, a container that measures exactly an epha is what he's seeing. Um, and so it, it could have been a basket, like it says, um, whatever he sees. And uh, there's a woman in it, and there's a cover of lead over it. And the woman's name is with Wickedness. And then two women with wings, like a stork, carry the basket or the epha um to babylon and they build a house for it to put put it there so, uh, another strange and interesting vision <laughs> so what does everybody make of this one <laughs> it probably says shiner which is another name for the land of babylon <laughs> Would take the language of that time to better understand this? This is a mystery to us. Probably. Is it, this, this wickedness uh, in, in verse 8, mm -hmm. it, it seems like in Revelation, you run into the harlot. Talks about the heart of Babylon and so forth. Don't have this here. I mean, is it <clears throat> crossing over or I don't know. I think Babylon is the heart of it, yeah. right? Yeah. I don't know. Is, is that um I have no idea. It's yeah. just I don't think the woman that is wickedness is the same as Babylon, okay. the nation. But I think Babylon in Revelation is not Babylon. No, it's, 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 a, a, it's a whole it's a, uh, it's a different nation or a yeah, future nation. Well, the nations are the whole just introduced by, the, by the angel. This is their iniquity. This is what? Their inequity. The we start the up of the basket. Um, and he says, this is their inequity. So, uh, and of course, they left the cover, and there's a woman, and this is wickedness. Mm -hmm. So they stuff her back in, and put the lead and weight down, and uh, take her to Babylon in the basket. Um, so I guess it represents the uh, inequities that are being. Uh, outline here, uh, pointed out in the vision, yeah. the woman in a basket. It could have to do with idolatry. Yeah. Um, the deity Astarte, the Phoenician deity Astarte, queen of heaven. Um, and yeah, I apologize for the yeah. Um, is sometimes confused also with Asherah. Um, and they would make bread cakes as offerings to this Queen of Heaven deity. Uh, and one of the things that they called her was holiness. So wickedness is the opposite of holiness. 
And so maybe this woman is the, the personification of the idolatry associated with worshiping Asherah. Are women the evil people or the animal people? Who? Women. I'm trying to understand who is the women. Um, I, yeah, this... <laughs> Um, it's unfortunate that it's women in this, in this Good say They are the woman is a metaphor, but um, we're we're definitely we are still dealing with a um, a culture that was very patriarchal and what they um and so that kind of I think maybe led into Zechariah's visions. But it for whatever reason it's it's a it's a woman that is personified wickedness. Um, but it's not an actual woman. <laughs> this is just a vision. Um I hate to fall back on numbers again, but I got <laughs> in the King James, they say that the lead weighed a hundred pounds. Where does it say that? King James version. Oh, in the King James version? Yeah. The lead weighed a hundred pounds. So now they're just throw adding things into that version. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know how I like to tease you. Hundred pounds. Yeah, Continue. it says a hundred pounds. Okay. Mm -hmm. The town of lead, a hundred pounds. Okay. And we're talking about the wicked. In this case, the basket and a human being. I'm not going to say human being. A human being and a hundred pound lead on a human being in a basket. The probability they're going to be crushed, right? Mm -hmm. Or something severe is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Well, in Revelation, and this is near the end, this is during the end times, the last three and a half years of the tribulation. And this is written as follows And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, and every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blaspheming God because of the plague of the hail. Now this hail weighed a hundred pounds. Hmm. Okay. And so they were crushing those who were blaspheming against God. Yeah. This hail that was coming down. So there seems to be, a, a, again, a connection here of a hundred pounds. Hmm. It, it's. I go back and uh, when they talk about uh, in verse eight, this is a wickedness. And I get a cross reference here to uh, Micah hmm. uh, chapter. Six six eleven, and it's talking about can I justify wicked scales and a bag of deceptive weights? Ah. And then if you yeah. go back to uh, Amos eight five, and he talks uh, when will the new moon uh, when will the new moon be over so that we may buy grain and the Sabbath that we may open. The wheat market to make the bushel smaller and the shekel bigger and to cheat with dishonest scales. You know, he did say that there may be something to do with um, uh, measuring devices and mm -hmm. and that there's yeah. dishonest scales and stuff because this is because it's a unit of measurement that he sees. And so, and this is one way if it was not, if they didn't have standard. Or if you know vendors were selling things and non-standard, you know, I mean, just think if we went to the store and we go, you bought a pound of flour, a bag of flour, and it wasn't a full pound, you'd say you were cheated, right? Yeah. And so, the, I, and so, the, I guess 
And he says that maybe this is connected, this, um, th these in unjust practices are connected to the idolatry that's going on, that because they're not worshiping God, they're worshiping these other gods, that they're, the injustice and the worshiping other gods go hand in hand. Well, in, in chapter 12 of, of Hosea, verse 7, it says, the merchant and whose hands are false talents. And so if you're making that cross-reference, maybe to, like I said, the measuring device. And Jesus ran into this in the temple. In the temple, yeah. And you know, when he came in there, people were inflated money and we still see it today, you know. I mean, there's more uh oh, yeah. there there there's more I can't think of the word now. Things in place to ensure that everything's standard, but people still find a way around it. The state has a people. whole weights and measures to it. The airlines seem to be around it at holiday time. Uh -huh. Still do the grocery stores. <laughs> yeah. Are there... I won't go down that that tangent. <laughs> We'll get stuck there. Whatever the, whatever it is, it seems, because I want to move on, it seems to me they're taking the wickedness, whatever that iniquity is, away to the land of Babylon. So it's being carried out of Judah and enshrined in Babylon, I guess. So maybe there is a connection. What's the purpose of it being set in place in Babylonia? I don't get that as the final well, location for this maybe it's uh it's it's taking that wickedness should come out of your life and be left to the world and i think babylon <laughs> might be referring to the world or the character of the world the worldly things and uh, and, and i think that's what it refers to in revelation as well but maybe it's taking taking that out of your life and leaving that in the world. Don't 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 be uh, overcome by the world, but overcome the world. It seems that in Zechariah, Jerusalem is is central, and wicked things go out of Jerusalem or are purged from Jerusalem, but the nations come into Jerusalem to seek God, and that's Jerusalem is the location where God is, uh, in Zechariah, anyway. So that, yeah, I think that makes sense. The King James verse footnote says, God's vision is so the people should put, well, I forgot my glasses, because <laughs> people should get, thank you. People should not let any form of wickedness deter them from the task of bringing the temple to completion. And that, be, and that could be talking about your own yeah. physical temple. Yeah. Let's go to chapter six, the eighth vision, the four winds of heaven. Uh, chapter six, verses one through eight. Would like to read that for us. Before you. I looked up again, and there before me were four chariots coming out from between two mountains, mountains of bronze. The first chariot had red horses, the second black, the third white, and the fourth dappled, all of them powerful. I asked the angel who was speaking to me, what are these, my lord? And the angel answered me, these are the four spirits of heaven going out from standing in the presence of the Lord of the whole world. The one with the black horses is going toward the north country. The one with the white horses towards the west. And the one with the dappled horses towards the south. When the powerful horses went out, they were straining to go throughout the earth. And he said, go throughout the earth. So they went throughout the earth. Then he called to me, look, those going toward the north country have given my spirit rest in the land of the north. So we have a repeat of the horses. And now you may notice that the visions have a correspondence with each other in what we call a chiastic arrangement, meaning that 
the two, the first one and the last one correspond to each other, the second one and the second to last, and so on and so forth to the middle. Um, and we you see we've gone from the whole world, narrowed in on Jerusalem, and then expanded back out, and now we're back to the whole world again. And two mountains. Two mountains. Zion, Zion and Mount Moriah. Hmm. Zion, Mount Moriah. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out. Those are the ones you throw out. <laughs> <laughs> About two miles <laughs> and four chariots, horses. Now, why the red horses aren't mentioned? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> they don't go towards the east. The others go towards the north, west, and south, and the red horses don't go. At <laughs> don't know. Uh, it could be that. In some way, I mean, they represent the winds, but maybe they also represent the sun in some ways. And the sun comes from the east, rises in the east, and, and sets in the west. So well, there my, may be some solar imagery going on here, maybe. My verse six, uh, black horse. Black. Uh, the black horse is going forth to the north country, and the white horse goes forth after them. Well, the dapple ones go forth to the south country. Hmm. I just have north and south. Hmm. White ones going to the west. It does. It, it does, does say. It does say that uh, that there's a. Uh, the Hebrew could also mean go after. Is there both possible things? <laughs> Around red horses? Well, the red horses are mentioned, red horses are mentioned. In, in verse two or verse uh, two, but it doesn't say where they go in in the explanation. <clears throat> they go to the east. <laughs> but this part about the the north country. And they've they've given my spirit rest in the land of the north. Uh, you know, this is this is right after the exile and the Babylonians came from the north to take the the Judeans. And this is where all of their adversaries have come from from the north. And so it seems like Zechariah is being given a, a vision that there's going to be a time of peace, a time of rest. And he's writing this when? 520 BCE. Or 519, probably. The Babylonians went in and 586. This is after the Persians have let Persians are now in charge. Yeah. They have let the Jews go back to their home. Would it be possible? You know, in Daniel's dream mm -hmm. of the great warrior, the the uh Greeks were considered in the dress as brass. Mm -hmm. And with that, with that armor, army, uh, there were four Germans. I don't know if there's any relationship to that, but when that, that uh, fact that that's brass, is that possible prophesizing of uh, what's going to take place after Babylon? And I don't think I would connect this with you don't the Greeks. That. Okay. No. I get. I see where you're coming from with the mountains of copper right. or bronze, rather. It says the mountains of bronze, bronze coming from between the mountains of bronze yeah. and chariot. But these chariots are not human uh, or Greek. These are these are the host of, of Yahweh. So I wouldn't. Okay. I wouldn't connect them with the Greeks. Okay. <clears throat> History, 
Well, we've gone from, you know, at the beginning, things were <clears throat> in disorder to things are now at rest. Seems like. What I find interesting in verse five, these are the four spirits of the heavens. But in Isaiah, he speaks of seven spirits. Hmm. Uh, I, do, you, do you know from a commentary standpoint? Well, the word is what ruach. The four spirits, the so word, what? It could also be wind, four winds. Oh, four winds. Yeah, the NIV calls it. Oh, okay. Which would make more sense, the four winds. Yeah. yeah. So talking about the four directions of the earth. And yes. yes. As you mentioned, four meaning the totality, the totality of the earth. earth. It says in, in Jeremiah 49:36, I shall bring upon Elam the four winds from the four ends of heaven, and shall scatter them to all these winds. And so forth and so on. <laughs> Any other comments on this vision? The banner itself in terms of what it can do in terms of destroying this, this puzzling. Well, I wanted to read this a little bit here. Um, it says, if God's spirit rested, then so should God's people. What follows from restored creation, then not simply temporally, but as a consequence, is Sabbath, sacred rest. Nothing is quite so hard to believe as this. Everything that truly matters and on which the world and its future utterly depends is accomplished without our effort. Indeed, it is even accomplished in spite of us. We therefore can only rest and bear witness to what is nowhere and in no respect obvious, yet is in every respect true. It's already been accomplished without our effort and even at times in spite of us. It's been accomplished, it's been finished. I like that, so I wanted to read it. Okay, let's close out chapter six with verses nine through 15. Um, so we're out of the visions now, but we have a, a word from God that comes to Zechariah to kind of close out this section. So if somebody read that nine through 15. The word of the Lord came to me. <clears throat> Collect silver and gold from the exile. Held I, Tobiah, and Jedah, Jediah. Who have arrived from Babylon, go the same day to the house of Hosei, the son of Zephaniah. Take the silver and gold and make a crown and set it on the head of the high priest Joshua, son of Jeho Jehozadak. Say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Here is a man whose name is Branch. For he shall branch out in his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he that shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear royal honor, and shall sit upon his throne and rule. There shall be a priest by his throne, with peaceful understanding between the two of them. 
and the crown shall be on the care of Haldai, Tobiah, Beat, Jediah, and Hosea, son of Zephaniah, as a memorial in the temple of the Lord. Those who are far off shall come and help to build the temple of the Lord. And you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. This will happen if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord, your God. Thank you, Ed. Uh, all right. Uh, so we're back in reality. <laughs> we're down from the, the heavenly plane and back on in uh, Jerusalem. Um, and... Uh, Zechariah is told to gather some precious metals from some of the exiles that have just come from Babylon and fashion a crown and put it on Joshua. And then we have a, a prophecy about the, the man named Branch. So the Joshua we think of is the son of Nun. That is a different Joshua. And so this Joshua... He is the son of Jehozadak, the son of Sariah, um, who was the last chief priest before the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem. So he is he is the heir to the high priest role in the temple. So will you be in the lineage? Is Zerubbabel is in the lineage, right? Uh, yeah, Joshua is not in the lineage of Jesus. He's the priest. Uh, Zerubbabel is in the lineage of Jesus as the grandson of the last king, the last legitimate king of Judah, and in the Davidic line. That's in Mary's lineage. Joseph's. I believe it's Joseph's. I ain't got a second guess. I think it's Joseph. That was my question too about Joshua. If that was the same one, so it's not. <laughs> uh, Joseph. Joseph's one again. Yes. Okay. Which the society was patrilineal. So even though Joseph wasn't technically the father, he was Jesus's father. <laughs> so he was Jesus's earthly father, which still made Jesus of the line of David. So David's son Solomon, Solomon, uh, Luke would choose Nathan. It would be Mary as the mother of Jesus. <clears throat> we'll, we'll do it later. I think I think Luke has the same genealogy, just goes back to Adam. I'm not aware of. Um, yeah. Is there a genealogy for Mary somewhere, Dave, that I'm forgetting about? I'm sorry, what was that? I don't think there's a genealogy for Mary. Yeah, I thought there was in Luke. Is there in Luke? I thought the genealogy of Mary goes back to Adam. It's not Mary, it's still Joseph. Okay. Uh, was Jesus was son about son 30 son years old. He, he was the son, as was thought, of Joseph. So now it's a different son of Heli, son of Matat, son of Levi, son of Bucky. But it still goes back to Joseph. Okay. Yeah. But we're getting off topic. <laughs> Can I? Uh, Joshua's not in the line. All right. So I'm looking yep. at, I'm looking at Ezra here. Uh huh. Okay. In reference to the, the this is the new temple. Uh huh. After the Babylonian captivity. Yes. Been destroyed now. Uh, but Medes and Persian of the Persian, king of Persia, sends the group of Jews back right, to Jerusalem to build a wall in the temple. Now, 
connect me with the branch because it speaks of who's building the temple in the Levites. The Levites, Levites from 20 years old and upwards set forth to build the house of the Lord. And the foundation of the temple of the Lord set the priest their appeal with trumpets. And the Lord after the ordinance of King David of Israel. So is the branch here Christ? Or is the branch? I think they thought the branch was Zerubbabel, but I I believe the branch is the Messiah, which would be Christ. Okay. In 12 and 13, you're looking at those verses. Yes. Yeah, because, yeah, you look in, uh, you go back to Isaiah 4 2. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be the pride and the adornment and, and adornment of the survivors of Israel. And, and, and it, it's just, it's in Jeremiah. Uh, there's just, oh, cool references, Zechariah, um, Ezra. And it's just uh, a lot of different references that speak to Christ, the Messiah. It says that he'll build the temple. And if you think of the temple as being Christ's body, right. which he speaks about, yeah. he will, mm -hmm. will destroy, be destroyed and he'll raise it in three days. Yes. Right? And if you think of the church as being the body of Christ on earth, and Christ says, on this rock, I will build my church of Peter, then he did build the temple. But it's, a, it's a temple without... Uh, and bricks and bricks. stones and mortar. Right. It's a temple of flesh and blood all over the earth. In Jeremiah 23, <clears throat> 5 and 6, it says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I shall raise up for, uh, for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act widely and do justice and righteousness in the land in his day. Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely, and this is his name by which he will be called the Lord uh, of Righteousness. And, and in, in, in uh, 3315, in those days and at that time, I will cause the righteous branch of David to spring forth and he shall execute justice and righteousness on the earth. I think that's a good place to pause. And uh, will somebody say a blessing for us? <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, gracious and loving God, we humbly come before you to praise and glorify you this evening as we lift up your word, lift up our hearts, our minds, and our souls that we might grab, gather our wisdom and knowledge and share it as we praise and glorify you for the blessed food that we are about to enjoy as we run this race according to your will. In the name of the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, amen. 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 David Karen had brought our snack tonight. He has to go get yeah. some of uh, And we'll come back at 8.15. Uh, how's everybody doing on Zoom? Is everybody good on Zoom? Right. Uh, I want to make sure you're not feeling left out. You can feel free to just jump in anytime you want. <laughs> or continue with your Sudoku, whatever. <laughs> <laughs>
right, we'll come back at 8.15. <laughs> I want to place that. Oh, Jackie, Jackie, uh, yes, we are doing the 24th at Church for All People and the next Sunday, too. I know you're going to be gone, I'm just telling you. Um, okay, the 24th, I'm doing the uh, hospitality at the church, okay, because they didn't have anybody else that uh, uh, would it was able to do it, okay. So and then, and then the, the 31st New Year's, New Year's Eve day. Yeah. Okay. I can do New Year's Eve day. That's I, not I a problem. Told her, I told her I didn't know if it'd be a problem on the 24th. And she said, if it is, they'll pitch in. Church for all people, you were talking but... to uh, uh, Jenny. No, uh, Jenny. Went to, I talked to uh, the young girl who preaches. Who sings in the choir? You know the main one, Luke and Liam's mother. Oh, okay. Uh, and she, did I can sermon. see her, and she, I can't think of her name. I can't either. And she did the sermon I know, Sunday. I know. Oh gosh. Oh my gosh. Okay. And you know who joined the church? Mark and his wife. Mark. I thought he belonged. Really? Yeah. And he. Had I thought he was already kilt. a member. I know he had his kilt on and everything. Wow. Well, that was nice. Well, it's worth having a very rational discussion. Well, where's the high anyway? You come there. That's a problem when you stop on the This is good. I was hoping that that initial was just a little bit of a it's like, I mean, if you want to see that. I told Bill have that. Well, but Bill's Roger better eat it. She first started in the hospital. Yeah, so it's just a little more. You know, they check them out. Guess what your latest mission is? I only have what you heard on Sunday. What they say? I've been texting that on Friday. Um, I know they eat I'm planning on going yeah. to see her tomorrow. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think a card is good. Just a thinking of you card. Still at Village, right? Yeah, she's still at Friendship Village. Um, he's good. He was here today for staff meeting. He looks great. His, his eyes good. He doesn't have any pain. He's good. I think, but I think Pam is. I think, I think she's got a broken heart, and I think she yeah, died yeah, in a broken yeah. heart. That would be my guess. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I can't blame her. I mean, yeah. Forced. Forced. No. No. I mean, I, can't, I think she just wants to go be with him, and I can't really blame her. Yeah. No, but she does have children. She does. I know. Kelly, Kelly has a lot of props. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know. Always has had. Dave said today about the new people. He said, I think the mom called her. Uh, I thought of that too. I thought she's there with mom now. Yeah. yeah. She's, 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 she's
Well, you've heard Andy say she talks at night. She just went to buy your remote. You know what? I haven't seen it. I heard that. Yeah, it's just not in the news. I don't know. 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 That's what you're aware of. <laughs> That's what I think of that. You can do what hair I have to worry about. I can get you a fire remote. Did you bake it? No. I couldn't bake cookies and compete with Carl. Carol. <laughs> compete with Carol? <laughs> no. 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 Those are Costco. I made the party mix, but not that. <laughs> Party mix is very good. <laughs> See? You get that today. And ice cream, yeah? Well, that's for Roger. Roger likes ice cream. Oh, look at the day towels. No, they take You know, I've tried all these diets over the years. Uh, and uh, my mom made me try that Atkins diet and all this stuff. Back when I was in divinity school, I tried my fitness pal counting my calories. It worked really well. But the problem was, I ate so little, my metabolism cut way down. And after I was done, I put the weight back on. So recently, I've been looking into this. Um, I've been going to the YMCA two times a week to lift weights. And I looked into this thing called cut and bulk. Where you, you you do a cut for some for a couple months, where you're eating less, but you're still going to the gym, but you're not putting on muscle because you're you're eating less and you're you're losing weight. Then you do what's called a bulk, where you eat more calories than your daily maintenance, and you keep lifting. You're supposed to put on muscle. So, uh, on Thanksgiving, I turned to Ellie and I said, starting today, I'm in a bulk. What do they know? I don't know. Yeah, I'm going to so this is very good. I'm going to eat all of this. I didn't see it. See, you didn't. Wow. 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 I didn't see it. I just found it. I discovered it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think it's over. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. All the way. Yeah. So he sat down. Hey, what's going on, Thomas? This crazy. Where it is? How's he got four diet books? Oh, no, no, no. Different ones. Oh, no. Oh, no. Pamela. 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 Oh, no.
I'm surprised you eat cookies, but not yours. <laughs> <laughs> How many dozens have you made so far? I'm not going too crazy. Okay, my nephew, my niece. I only have one kind of I have one kind of And how many dozens of those do you make now? That's what I do. My wife used to be a little You know, she... Well, you have our thing to turn out, and then yeah. when I was Put them on the board. Now, I'm going to bring back the dining room table spoon gingerbread, boys. Right now, fine, that was your hand. That Christmas time a few years ago, we were having a bathroom for you. Christmas time. Yeah. 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 And I met an hour in the hall and he said, I have a confession. And I said, Boy, I, 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 I took a couple of cookies, but I couldn't get it down. I cut out. This year I cut out two cookies. I used to do 250 guys. They are good cookies. Thank you. Good ice cream. Have you ever had her cookies? Have you ever had her cookies? Have you ever had her cookies? Oh. I mean, those cookies were good. I didn't make them. Oh. The three times that cookie is the favorite. And then the nuts. My friends are these are either sugar cookies or this one called Harold and Pinnacles, which is a chocolate snowy. It's worse than I made those big slices. Good chocolate, not good for me. No, no. And my granddaughter sent me a text message a couple weeks ago and said, Oh, can I have a good white recipe? I want to make gingerbread boys for my friends. Christmas mm -hmm. Oh, wow. That made me feel good. How old is she, Carol? Well, that's, that's pretty enterprising. enterprising. <laughs> it's like her grandmother. <laughs> she loves to bake. Oh, good. She got that on it. Not nice. I love to bake. I thought I had done pretty well one Easter for the grandkids. And Carol showed me a photograph of what she did for her granddaughter. She took an umbrella, a darling umbrella, opened it up, turned it upside down, and filled it full of presents. Oh, oh my God. God. Oh, well, hey. <laughs> you have two big children? This is the one. Oh, okay. You remember. She's in Florida. That's where mm -hmm. the is, right? <laughs> It's been a busy day. We got all the How many cards, kids uh, did you have here? Yeah. yeah. He does the Christmas cards. I don't touch them. Put uh, all the addresses in the database and set up the printer and there they go. Yeah. And push the button. And... <laughs> we use a website that does it all for you. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. It's called Postable. You put upload your address book to it. And then you can create a card and then you can mass send it out. You just click a button and it sends the card mm -hmm. for you to everybody. It costs a little more, probably. For regular mail? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They'll send it for you. Well, I did. That's how we did our wedding invitations. <laughs> <laughs> What's the name of the one? Postable. Oh, I addressed. Well, I did, the computer did, but 87, 86 envelopes in about well, less than an hour. And he just goes through and signs them. 
He just writing anything. Anyone out there for Christmas cards yet? Yeah. 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 All right, let's uh, start. We got a lot of ground to cover in 45 minutes. So, start back in. Uh, we're actually going to go ahead and, and read all of chapter seven because it's not that long. Uh, and we are now jumping ahead a couple years. Uh, and Zechariah's visions are done. And this seems to be a message that he has in response to this inquiry that comes at the beginning of chapter 7. He's got an inquiry, and, and then he preaches this message to the whole people. So um, we are going to we'll wait. We'll wait for David. To get oh, that's he because the ice cream. He had to go for the ice cream. Or Roger. I don't want him to miss. How many kids and grandkids do you have here? Two kids and five grandchildren. Five grandchildren. Are any of them close? Or? They're all in Arlington. Oh, nice. So the oldest one's now in Chicago, and the next one's at Miami, Florida, yeah. uh, Miami of Ohio. Oh. Those of us are in school here. Nice. Okay. So who would like to read Chapter 7? I don't have glasses. I have an empty page here. I'm going to read. No. No. In the fourth year of Darius the king, the Lord's word came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month, Islam. My footnote says that's November, December. The people of Bethel sent Sherzar and Regum Malak along with his men to seek the Lord's favor, saying to the priests who were in the house of the Lord of heavenly forces and to the prophets, should I weep in the fifth month and abstain as I have done for a number of years? Then the word of the Lord of heavenly forces came to me. Say to all the land's people and to the priests, when you fasted and lamented in the fifth month and the seventh month for these past 70 years, did you fast for me? When you ate and drank, weren't you the ones eating and drinking? Weren't these the words that the Lord proclaimed through the former prophets in Jerusalem was dwelling quietly? along with the surrounding cities, and when the arid south, southern plain and the western foothills were inhabited, the Lord's word came to Zechariah. The Lord of heavenly forces proclaims, make just and faithful decisions. Show kindness and compassion to each other. Don't oppress the widow, the orphan, the stranger, and the poor. Don't plan evil against each other. But they refused to pay attention. They turned a cold shoulder and stopped listening. They steeled their hearts against hearing the instruction and the words that the Lord of heavenly forces sent by his spirit through the earlier prophets. As a result, the Lord of heavenly forces became enraged. So just as he called and they didn't listen, when they called, I didn't listen, says the Lord of heavenly forces. I scattered them throughout the nations whom they didn't know. The land was devastated behind them with no one leaving or returning. They turned a delightful land into a wasteland. Uh, all right. Uh, so we have this inquiry that comes from the people of Bethel. Uh, should we continue this practice of mourning and, and fasting that we've been done? And uh, a note that my commentary has is that the fifth month, um, that was when the temple was destroyed by Babylon, or around that time. And what calendar is it? I believe that this is still the Persian okay. calendar, but Tislev is the Jewish month. So I think he's saying this month is the ninth. This is also, I think the ninth month is the Persian calendar and Chislev is the Jewish calendar. Okay. So this is November, December of mm -hmm. 518, mm -hmm. a couple of years later. we jumped in time. What was this exercise of fasting? Fifth month or certain times? What was this about? So they were fasting because they were fasting in mourning. They were fasting over their situation, their predicament that they were in exile, that the temple had been destroyed, that their people had been 
desolated, you know, the, and so that's why they were fasting um, as an appeal to God to deliver them. He questioned why they're fasting. Well, he says, was it for me that you fasted or was it for you? Do you, do you not eat and drink only for yourselves? Do I need food or drink or, you know? This is a practice for you, I guess, is what he's saying. And then so verses. Wonder how many seven, things do we do? Yeah. To practice for ourselves. Uh, yeah. Good question. It has become tradition, and we just do it. That's a good question. But I don't think I don't think Zechariah is saying it's good or bad necessarily. In fact, by the end of the sermon, we'll kind of see what he's saying. But just that this isn't. You know, why are you asking me? This is for you. <laughs> Verses 7 through 14 then talk about what the ancestors were asked to do and what they refused to do and the consequences of that. I want to spend a little bit of time here because it's important. I think it's a little confusing. Verse 8 is kind of in the middle of this, but I think he's saying these are the words of the former prophets. Render true judgments, show kindness. You know, this is the word of God that came through these former prophets. To render true judgment, show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the orphan, the alien, or the poor. Do not devise evil in your hearts and against one another. But their ancestors refused to listen. That verse has been spelled out by many prophets. Yeah. Is it Naaman? Something. Be a bunch of them. Amos, Micah. Yeah. Almost almost all of them that we've read, <laughs> seems like, have said something similar. Kind of makes you think. You know, when are we going to be judged? Oh, well, now Alabama. Yes, they're in Jerusalem. They're back. They're back in back in the land of Jerusalem. The coming is over 10, 15 years. I think I read somewhere. But when it's like one trip. Right, there were multiple groups over the years that came back. Yeah. Well, there's certainly a pattern here. And what I see here from this prophecy is, is this prophecy prophesizing what will take place with the nation of Israel after they crucified Christ? Because in this... Acts, it speaks of the heart of stone. And it speaks of the nation was scattered abroad after the crucifixion because of unbelief. Now, is this? This is talking about what happened back in the past mm -hmm. to their ancestors. Because then in chapter eight, he's going to say, but, uh, but now mm -hmm. I'm going to return to you and, you know, and, it, and he's going to repeat himself, uh, you know, don't, uh, don't do evil, uh, uh, make true judgments, um, no false testimony. And now you stick to this, not like your ancestors who didn't listen. 
but you keep my commandments um, and I will continue to be good to you. The ironic thing mm -hmm. is after Stephen's testimony and act, right. and their hearts were hardened, <clears throat> so they stoned him. Mm -hmm. Then it goes on to say, and they were scattered abroad in the 1800s, right? Their land was dead, desolate. So there's a pattern here that they're not learning. No, <laughs> you're right. You know, I, I read this and, and said they, they made their hearts like flint so they could not hear the law and the word which the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the form of prophets. Therefore, great wrath came upon us, uh, came from the Lord of hosts. I, I read that and then I, then I think about, uh, go back to, to Luke in chapter 16, the rich man and Lazarus. Mm -hmm. And the rich man says, you know, uh, let me go back and talk to my brothers so they don't end up in this place or, or send somebody back. And, and, and he said, but Abraham said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. That's pretty powerful. One important thing was when these folks came back, there were different languages. Seventy years, they did not all speak Hebrew, Arab, whatever Persian you speak. But there were different languages. And when Ezra read in the Book of Deuteronomy, they had translators, and they stood for all this reading. But these people were not of one mind and one spirit, one language. Well, complicated. Maybe that's the theme of this whole uh, Bible study. The prophets keep saying over and over again, render true judgment, show kindness and mercy to one another. Don't depress the widow, the orphan, the alien, or the poor. Don't devise evil in your hearts against each other. Don't, you know, plan up at night how you're going to steal each other's property and then act on it in the morning, you know. Um, quit, you know, using using the courts to oppress the poor. Uh, these are these are. This isn't so much individual sin as it is the whole society, the whole mm -hmm. city, the whole nation. The way that it's operated, the justice within the nation is um, corrupt, and so the whole nation. You can't get it right, and it's over and over and over again. We went through this with the, with Israel and the Assyrians. We went through it with Judah and the Babylonians, and now we're going through it after they come back to Judah. But as you pointed out, Dave, they just keep getting it wrong. Is, we keep getting it wrong. Saying, we're still right? doing that. It's the characteristics of the world. Yeah, which, which yeah. is why I said, you know, don't be overcome by the world. Right. And the world. And, th and they were supposed to be set apart from the world. They were supposed to, their whole society was supposed to operate differently. You know, every 50 years, all the debts get reset. They haven't done that since, well, since Assyria conquered the northern tribes. Mm -hmm. Well, we can't do it with all the, without all the tribes here. And we're doing the same, we're doing the same <clears throat> thing, right? Still, according to the ways of the world, <laughs> dishonest weights, just to, different ways of going about it. I liked mine it says here, any sin seems more natural the second time. Mm. Mm. Oh, mm. Oh, As you become yeah. hardened, each, rep each repetition is easier. Ignoring or refusing God's warning hardens you each time you go wrong. Is that kind of like, if you tell a lie enough times, you think yeah. it, it's true? Yeah. Yeah. Like once you worry about it the second mm. time, you don't worry so much about well, it. Waylon Jennings wrote a song one time. The devil made me do it the first time. The second time I've done it on my own. <laughs> I just like that. It seems yeah. more and magical the second time. What you're saying, yeah. Or to build on that, if it's a societal sin, it if you're born into it, and it's the way that we've always done it, and the way it's always been done, 
It just seems natural. It doesn't seem like sin. It's me that takes me back to the beginning when we talk about squaring on the Bible. Mm -hmm. Some people are squaring the Bible. Does it mean anything? Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean anything to them at all. Yeah. I mean, that's why it's important to read these old prophets. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I think about, like, uh, American slavery back back in the day, the people that were born into it, that that's just the way society was. But it was Christians who started the abolitionist movement. It was the you know, it was white Christians who said, this is wrong. And, yeah. You know, even though that's the way things were, that's just the way it was in society. I think they read scripture and some of this stuff spoke to them. They said, well, God says this is wrong. We got to stop doing this. But there's good news. <laughs> As we move forward in this Zechariah. Let's do that. Let's let's continue on. Yes. Well now, because that was chapter seven was the question and then the beginning of the response. This is what your ancestors did. Now, now we're getting to now. Chapter eight. Um and so <clears throat> I'm going to read from the JPS version. No idea what it says. <laughs> I've been reading NIV and RSV here. So, uh, The word of the Lord of hosts came to me. Thus said the Lord of hosts. I am very jealous for Zion. I am fiercely jealous for her. Thus said the Lord, I have returned to Zion and I will dwell in Jerusalem. Jerusalem will be called the city of faithfulness and the mount of the Lord of hosts, the holy mount. Thus said the Lord of hosts, there shall yet be old men and women in the squares of Jerusalem, each with staff in hand because of their great age. And the squares of the city shall be crowded with boys and girls playing in the squares. Thus said the Lord of hosts, though it will seem impossible to the remnant of this people in those days, shall it also be impossible to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Thus said the Lord of hosts, I will rescue my people from the lands of the east and from the lands of the west, and I will bring them home to dwell in Jerusalem. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and sincerity. Thus said the Lord of hosts, take courage, you who now hear these words, which the prophets spoke when the foundations were laid for the re rebuilding of the temple, the house of the Lord of hosts. For before that time, the earnings of men were nil, and prophets from beasts were nothing. It was not safe to go about one's business on account of enemies, and I set all men against one another. But now I will not treat the remnant of this people as before, declares the Lord of hosts, but what it sows shall prosper. The vine shall produce its fruit, the ground shall produce its yield, and the sky shall provide their moisture. I will bestow all these things upon the remnant of this people. And just as you were a curse among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so when I vindicate you, you shall become a blessing. Have no fear, take courage. For thus said the Lord of hosts, just as I planned to afflict you and did not relent when your fathers provoked me to anger, said the Lord of hosts. So at this time, I have turned and planned to do good to Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Have no fear. These are the things you are to do. Speak the truth to one another. Render true and perfect justice in your gates. And do not contrive evil against one another. And do not love perjury, because all those are things that I hate, declares the Lord. And the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, thus said the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month, the fast of the fifth month, the fast of the seventh month, and the fast of the tenth month shall become occasions for joy and gladness, happy festivals for the house of Judah, but you must love honesty and integrity. Thus said the Lord of hosts, peoples and the inhabitants of many cities shall yet come. The inhabitants of one shall go to the other and say, let us go and entreat the favor of the Lord. Let us seek the Lord of hosts. I will go too. The many peoples and the multitude of nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of the Lord. Thus said the Lord of hosts, in those days, ten men from nations of every tongue will take hold. They will take hold of every Jew by a corner of his cloak and say, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. <clears throat> so there's a lot to unpack in here, but essentially, yes, a reversal of fortunes. First judgment and the blessing. Yeah. Yeah. So there's going to be there will be people young and old playing in the streets, spending time in the city, 
even though it seems impossible to the remnant of this people in these days, should it also seem impossible to me? That's that's back to what you heard in reference before, the sovereignty of God. There's nothing that God can do. Mm -hmm. Well, there's references to Haggai in here too. He says, you know, when the prophets spoke who were present when the foundation was laid for the rebuilding of the temple. We just read that at the end of Haggai, the foundation being laid of the temple, um, which was about two years ago from this speech that he's given. It's been two years. And what's ironic, Paul spoke of the foundation as a wise master builder. He said, be careful how you lay upon the foundation of which Christ has laid it. In other words, who laid the foundation? Christ laid the foundation. You think that you've laid it, but rude awakening. Mm -hmm. In the Europe, I don't know who was one, but the Jews they have certain jobs. Um, merchandising and banking. Christians could not charge interest to other Christians. The Jews had no problem with it. <laughs> so there were certain industries. It was the only thing the Jews could do. Does that ring, bell, ring bells today? <laughs> uh, is, that, is that where that stereotype comes from then? The stereotype. Look at the, look at the Jewish people we know here in Columbus. They're all merchants. Most of them are Woven into their heart. Well, the Spanish Inquisition question. Does this have to do with chapter eight? <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, <laughs> let's come back to chapter eight. Let's come back to chapter eight. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, comments or questions? I know we covered a lot in chapter eight, um, but there's there's some individual sections that you can break it out into. Um, and uh, we can go kind of anywhere in the chapter. If you have any comments or questions or anything that stood out to you. Well, verse two, you know, people have said, well, we're, we're in New Testament times now. So, and uh, it's not about, the, not about the Jews anymore and so forth. And, and right there in verse two, it says, I, I, I am exceedingly generous for Zion. That's what great wrath on jealous over. Now well, mine says passion. Yeah. That, yeah. Yes. And, and uh, God has not forgotten. Well, in Hebrews, it talks about God has not forgotten the Jewish mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. We got a little sense of the word. Has he forgotten the Jewish people? No, he has. Now he, they are his chosen. Well, and we are chosen as a result. Of them. Mm -hmm. and, and people that are out there in the streets railing against them, I always oh, just I go back to that mm -hmm. idea I will curse those who curse you mm -hmm. and bless those who bless you. We had a um, call back to that here in, or was it, where he says, mm -hmm. Um, you know, the cows is verse 13, uh, just as you have been a curse among the nations of house of Judah and house of Israel, I will save you and you shall be a blessing. Chris, mm -hmm. and I need your help on this. Uh-huh. Because you did Genesis, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of Rahab. And Rahab said, we know, I think she was speaking of um, the uh, separation of the sea. And that the Israelites came through Egypt to the land and came to, oh, into the world of life. And I thought in Genesis, Rahab says, we know something to the fact that what you've done, and for that reason, my understanding that came through the scarlet 
of redemption where she laid a red scarf or something at the window to protect them when they went into uh, Jericho. Mm -hmm. And of course, Rahab is in the lineage of Christ. Yes. <clears throat> Get the reference. Yeah. Um, Joshua 2. Because she let this she let the spies in. Right. And then she covered for them. Right. Um she says in verse nine, I know that the Lord has given the country to you because bread of you has fallen upon us, and all the inhabitants of the land are quaking before you. We've heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the That's sea. It. Right. When you left Egypt, what you did to Sion and Og, the two Amorite kings across the Jordan. The Lord your God is the only God in heaven above and on earth below. Now, okay. since I have shown loyalty to you, swear to me that you will show loyalty to my family. Which Provide me a sign. Which they did, right? They were blessed. <clears throat> they did. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, tie this length of crimson cord to the window through which you let us down. So that was the sign that they spared. They spared her. So that's why it's an example of what in verses 23, and those days shall come to pass and 10 men shall take hold of the language of the nation and shall take hold of the skirt of him it's the Jews saying, we will come with you, for we have heard that God is with you. In a uh, way, yeah. that's revealing. Well, but then there's also Ruth, who decides to go back to right. Naomi. Yeah. Your people shall be my people, right. and your God will be my God. Yeah. Uh, notice in verses 16 and 17, once again, um, it's, you know, I'll, I'll do good for you, but this is what you have to do. Speak the truth to one another. Render judgments that are true and make for peace. Uh, do not devise evil against one another. And do not swear falsely or take <clears throat> false oaths. Conditions. Pastor Chris. Yes, Jackie. Um, in the uh, Touchpoint Bible, on that uh, verse 16, what it says here about fairness. When we cheat people, we wrong them in at least two ways. First, we fail to give them what is rightfully theirs. Second, we devalue them as people. We mm -hmm. are saying, I am more important than you, so it's all right for me to take what is yours. When we mm -hmm. see other people as valuable, it follows that we will treat mm -hmm. them fairly. Mm -hmm. I like that. Mm -hmm. That would solve so many things. Mm -hmm. I heard one time, <clears throat> blowing my candle out won't make yours burn. Mm. Right. In verses 18 and 19, he has... This is kind of his response to that question that was asked, the first question about, should we continue to mourn and fast? Now, at first the question was, should we mourn and fast in the fifth month? 
now we've gone from just the fifth month to the fourth month, the fifth month, the seventh month, and the tenth month. He says, they shall be seasons of joy and gladness, not mourning, cheerful festivals. And that uh, you should love truth and peace. And so fast if you want to fast or don't, but this is a time of celebration. So the fasting was for you, right? It wasn't for God, it was for you. But the, this is a time of celebration because we're not in mourning anymore. Those 70 years are over. Would that fourth month and fifth month refer to <coughs> the planting season? And then the seventh month and the tenth month and harvest? <clears throat> Maybe. And celebration of planting and harvesting. And I don't know what all celebrations they have. Planting and harvesting. What well, also speaks of their feast days. The what? Their feast days. Yeah. Especially those three major ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have any references here as to what those paths would be. But... Pastor Chris, in my Bible, it says that uh, in the commentary that the fifth month recalled the burning of the temple. And it references 2 Kings 25 verses 8 through 10. And that the seventh month marked the assassination of Gedaliah. Oh, and again, yeah, I did that, have that. That's yeah. from 2 Kings um, 25, 22 through 25. I did have that. I'm not sure what the fourth and tenth months were. So mm -hmm. thank you, Beth. Uh huh. My book uh, says that the fourth month of the Hebrew lunar calendar usually occurs in June and July. The fifth month occurs in July and August. And the seventh month usually occurs in September and October. The 10th month usually occurs in December and January. So what Bill was saying about the planting seizing seasons and then the harvesting, that would be about it. Well, this vision at the end is, uh, uh, it's not a vision, sorry, but what Zechariah envisions at the end of chapter eight um, kind of reminds me of some of the other uh, prophecies from other prophets we have studied of what the time of peace at the end is going to look like. This is more focused on Jerusalem, though, and on other nations coming to uh, the Jews for spiritual guidance. I'd like very much to understand what kind of worship they had in the seven years. I know we have prophets, these minor prophets, that were actually there. But to me, it'd be interesting to know what kind of worship, what kind of knowledge was passed on? Mm -hmm. What did these mean? Went from children to seven years old. What did they have? Daniel continued to pray. Huh? Daniel continued to pray. And uh, I'm sure that the 
the generations, the, the older generations that were exiled into Babylon passed down the knowledge to the younger generations, not especially the, um, the priests. Um, I'm sure Joshua learned from his father and probably uh, Zerubbabel also. And they had Ezekiel, too. And one thing we started was actually 20 years into um, Nebuchadnezzar's uh, kingdom. So there were prophets there that we read about. Are they standing on the street corner? Were they? I don't know. Maybe they met in their homes. I don't know. Did they? They grabbed. They must have had some of those scrolls that they brought with them. Doesn't uh, Ezra and Nehemiah find a uh, scroll? Take it back from the rubble. Am I making that up? No, <laughs> <It's a lot. laughs> uh, it was Ezra, I think. So Ezra, they found the scroll and they stood and yeah. they read it all day, and, oh, they, and they were that's, just uh, that's after the uh, after the pre yeah, they were pre renovating, yeah, they were renovating the temple exactly, and they found it was a book of Deuteronomy, right. That they found. And they stood for. They found it hours. in the. Yeah. They found it in the debris in the temple, right? right. Okay, so I, I knew I wasn't crazy. <laughs> and they, yeah, and then they went through the land and threw out all the idols and just that and the other, purged the land. I wanted to read this because I had never looked at the this parable like this. Um, um, we're talking about God's grace here. Uh, trying to figure out where to start. I'll just start at the beginning. Uh, this sermon contains more than the proclamation of God's grace. Uh, on the authority of the prophets and of the experience of the divine word, Zechariah carefully delineates the grounds of God's judgment, whose effects the community still suffers. Those grounds are summarized as disobedience and as an incredibly adamant rejection of God's instruction made known to the people through the prophets. This instruction was neither unusual nor onerous. It was beneficent and charted the way to a healthy and whole community. Practice authentic justice, exhibit mutuality and compassion, do not defraud the socially vulnerable, do not plot to each other's harm. Why the ancestors living in prosperity would reject such minimal and even obvious conditions of a community's well-being was as incredible in Zechariah's day as it remains in ours. Unlike the exercise of God's grace, then, the exercise of God's judgment can be traced to the community's rejection of these fundamentals of community life. This balance between God's grace and God's judgment can be illustrated by reference to the parable found in Matthew 18, 23-35. The parable recounts how a king forgives the debts of one of his slaves out of pity for him. Yet this very same slave, when he encounters one of his debtors, will not forgive the man's debts, but instead has him cast into prison. When the king learns of the slave's actions, he rescinds his former agreement and hands the man over to be tortured until he pays off his debt. The man had received grace in the king's act of social and economic justice toward him, yet he would not enact the same basic tenets of social justice toward his debtor. The social practices outlined in Zechariah chapter 7 give the community the opportunity to respond in kind to the grace God extends to them. When they reject those practices, they reject the grace that lies at the heart of God and in so doing become a people of desolation. I never thought of the parable in that way, that we receive God's grace or we accept God's grace only in so far as we extend God's grace. I read a daily devotion, and at the bottom of the daily devotion, it said you could stop showing mercy when God stops showing it to you. Mm. 
You should preach that some Sunday. I think I will. I think I will preach that parable some yeah, Sunday. Yeah. 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 Um, we talked about yeah. receiving the gift of God's grace, but I never thought of it in that way. That mm -hmm. to not extend grace to someone is to reject <laughs> God's gift. <laughs> That's what that parable kind of says. The first one you started reading, and I was th thought he was going to speak about Lazarus and the, and the rich man. Mm -hmm. I, I think even uh, in, in our book that we're going to mm -hmm. go over Thursday morning, uh, in the one story he talked about forgiveness, and well, well, the lady ran into his jeep. Mm. knocked it over and, went over. and um, she kept calling him and he said if if she did not believe that I forgave her and if we don't believe that God is so good that he can forgive us then what are we doing mm. Mm. And uh, which may go along with that. And there's some. Well, I think that goes along with this, uh, with what we just studied tonight, yeah. too. I mean, it says, you know, the remnant of this people think it's impossible that the city could be anything ever again, that God could be good to us again. You know? But God is so good that He can forgive and forget. Yeah. And I think, I've always said, I think that's the hardest thing is just to forgive yourself. And uh, get set with the idea that it's been forgiven and forgotten and it's in the past. I don't know that I really believe that. Personally, I mean, I'm giving grace to accept grace. If I'm thinking, you know, I'm understanding. I don't think we do anything to get God's grace. We don't have to do yeah. anything for God to offer it. <clears throat> but if we accept God's grace, then we should be gracious yeah. enough yeah. to pass it on. Are you saying unless you pass it on, you have to turn and accept it? I, that's, that's the way that I read it. But well, I think there's something spiritual that happens too when you accept Christ. And that that's you... why Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless you be born again, you'll not enter the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Because you have to truly believe, as Paul said, that when Christ was crucified, we were crucified. When Christ was buried, we were buried. When Christ risen, we were risen. That's the message of being wanted. Well, he also says, you know, my you'll know my disciples by their fruit. By their well, fruit. Their yeah, fruit. Yeah. fruit. And I it's not, I don't think it's a works righteousness because we can mess up. And that's why there's forgiveness and that's why there's grace. We can mess up. But I think it's more, I think there's something spiritual that happens and there's there's an attitude or just a general way of living that's in Jesus, that's in Christ. Whenever, every Sunday we say, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. So if, we're, if we accept God's grace, then we should, we, we have to pass it on. But you know, I just thought about something at the beginning we talked about, do we do that out of habit or do we do it because we believe it? That's mm -hmm. important. Yeah. That's very. We forgot. We just had a habit because we were really. Is it for us? You know what? It's taking God and it's word. Oh, she said. She said. He said you earlier when we talked about habits. So, like when he said, "He said, you know, forgive us our sins and forgive those who forget who sinned against us." Is that just one of those prayers we say out of habit, or we saying that for God and we really believe it? Are we doing it for him or for us? Is that just kind of the thought, uh, the methodical? We just do it without thinking. I, I think there's a lot of people that say it and they don't know what they're saying. It's one of those memory things. You just you do it because you're supposed to. Yeah. Well. 
I mean, you say it because you're supposed to, but it, doing it, it's different. So we say we agree that he chooses us and we accept it or not? Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. He chooses us. He chose all of us. Yeah. We had God's God. grace is freely offered mm -hmm. all the time. It's there. If you accept it. If you accept or not. Yeah. And I think that's where Paul talks about some predestination in there, and that, that gets yeah. into a deep hole sometimes. But I think that all people, when I think before mankind was ever created, that people were predestined to become part of the kingdom of God if you accept it. And that if is great. Right. Yeah, <laughs> because God, you know, it says what in, in Second Peter said, so don't count God as being slow because he wants everyone to come to the kingdom. <clears throat> but there are those who will not. The letter to Titus oh. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. Well, the kingdom's been kind of spelled out for us in in a lot of these prophets and what it's what it's going to look like and the, the dimensions of the kingdom or the the, uh, the way that people are going to treat each other. Um and uh, uh so the other part of that prayer is thy kingdom come thy will be done now how many people pray that but if it actually happened <laughs> you know uh, their whole way of life would be you know thrown out and so I, you know i wonder um you know when you talk about people accepting or, or wanting to be in the kingdom uh, I, I I don't know. I think that uh, there, there's a way of living that uh, if we want to live in the kingdom, we're going to have to abide by. Is that happen, you know, as soon as we get in it, you know, we just suddenly decide? Um, or does God have to work on us a little bit? I don't know. I don't know. Sounds like a sermon to me. Sometimes it can just be a last minute thing too, like the yes. thief on the cross. Yeah. How did you get here? No, no. I don't know. <laughs> the guy in the middle cross said I could be here. Do you not wonder about that thing? You know, he stole with the wrong. Yeah. But his heart, his attitude his heart was, right. yeah. was in the right place. Yeah. Well, he he he. he he confessed his sin. He said, we deserve what we're getting. Which is why I go back to saying we can still mess up. Uh, but I think there's a difference between messing up, knowing that you did something wrong, confessing up to it, and the way that you live your life and the attitude and whether you're producing fruit or not. I also wonder how many people say, I'm a Christian because it's the popular thing to do in their community. Maybe that's why Jesus said, some will say, Lord, we did this and we did that. And he said, I don't know. That's not, that's not up to me to judge, though. That's no, not no, that no, person in no, God. No, no, no. I'm seeing that person in God. That's Jesus' territory. Yeah. <clears throat> Pastor Chris. All right. Don't you yeah. think that part of it is when people tell you that they are a Christian? Why is it they're having to tell you? They should you you should be able to observe that by their actions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My experience at times has been that if someone is telling me that they are a Christian, I almost want to turn around and walk away. Uh, yeah. Now, if somebody point blank ask you, are you a Christian? That's one thing. That's one thing. 
Because I've had people, I'm a Christian, so then it's like a but. And it's like whatever they say afterwards is what they really mean. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? That first part doesn't mean anything. Yes. But I don't like this, or, but I just somehow disagree. They're, they're using it as a status symbol, yes. kind of. Mm -hmm. It's a hymn, well, no, we are Christians by our love, by our love. Mm -hmm. That, I think that's in John, isn't it? They'll know, they'll know my disciples by the love. They'll know that you are my disciples by your love. Isn't it? I'll have to look at it. I have to ask you the hymn that they thought scripture. <laughs> it's somewhere in there. I we read it a long time ago and couldn't tell you now. So I'll mm -hmm. ask you guys to look it up. <laughs> I think it's pretty deep. I think we covered a lot of ground. I think we did. Yeah, I think that was good. Um, prayer concerns. I'm going to put Pam and Lois on here. Yes. Lois really concerns me. She's talking about not doing anything. And I talked with a friend last night that was diagnosed two years ago with stage four breast cancer and that metastasized elsewhere. And medication is giving her an excellent quality of life. Yes. She's still traveling the world. Mm -hmm. No. I think all the I know I said Lois Sunday that sometimes medicine just prolongs your life, but the inevitable is still going to happen. But Maybe not. Maybe it can prolong it and her still have excellent quality of life. I'm not so sure that she has excellent quality of life. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep her in our prayers. Yeah. I know that she's in a lot of pain and medications yes. aren't working for her. So she has a lot of lot of allergies. Yeah. A lot of bad allergies. To the medications? Yeah. Yes. I asked for our granddaughter that's going to have, to have surgery on her knees. Uh, she was here and her knee cap went out of place. Mm -hmm. oh, she right. doesn't, right doesn't have a, a groove or something in there that keeps it in place. Mm -hmm. Well, on the MRI last Wednesday morning showed that it said there's a lot of things in her knees that aren't right. And that's why the kneecaps won't stay in place. And, 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 uh, and and our, and our son and his wife, I mean, uh, their insurance is just horrible. Because, I mean, why do you even have insurance? Their insurance is so crap. And we're trying to get her in the Shriners, and, and the Tampa hospital shut down, and the closest one is in South Carolina, which is about eight hours away. And so anyway, keep them in your fridge. What's her first name? Charlotte. Charlotte. Well, Charlotte Louise. This is because she has three old fashioned ladies. <laughs> My brother in law, Bud, had um, a new diagnosis at Ohio State with his lymphoma after 17 years. They had come to a conclusion. The treatments that he got did help to a degree, or he wouldn't still be here. But this new treatment got the pills at 6 30 tomorrow. Mm. He starts it tomorrow and uh, just got determination and total faith in God for his life. So, Bud is uh, starting a new medicine tomorrow. And we just pray that it has some benefits for this new family and not certain how that well for what it may turn out to be, but certainly prayers are. Uh, in place and needed. And thankfulness too that he's come this long to a lot of various treatments and great hospitals before this one here at Ohio State, but they seem to really have things focused in the area of cancer treatment and lymphomas when it was cancer. Yes, I was just thinking this morning, I guess the previous life part, I was very involved with establishing a blue Christmas tradition. I think this is going to be a very good Christmas for a lot of people. 
I think people need to remember it's that hobo bow as usual for a lot of people. We do have a blue Christmas service um, at 7 p.m. on the 21st. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it, the thing that we, we did all this, I know, I remember talking about it. maybe you're having a great Christmas. You're going to have to show up for somebody else. Mm -hmm. This is a year you got to show up for somebody else because maybe you're doing okay, but not everybody is this year. When you think of the world and everything that's going on, it's not. It's not just Christmas as normal. How's your friend Bill? Bill is. Uh, <clears throat> it's amazing, and I think this week does he have two treatments? I don't think so. I mean, yeah, like two to three weeks between. It, yeah. Two, but I mean, his age. prostate's down to two point three yeah. from seventeen. To, oh um, wow! Well, yeah. it's an experimental drug. Experimental drug and approved in Australia, but not in the United States. But we're, we're apparently Charlie is allowing to have it tested, and validated. Oh, nice. So, and he's eighty-seven years old. Oh, listen to that. Stage four. I don't understand uh, why Jews are so persecuted. The only thing I know, and over the centuries in the Catholic Church, I've always, you know, because the Jews killed Jesus. I don't know why are the Jews so persecuted. Satan's after them. Why? Because Satan does anything he can to this. Huh? Satan does anything he can to destroy what God has. And the Jews are gods, and so Satan's after them. But why are they doing this? Because yes. Satan is the father of lies. I mean, that. but when the Romans killed Jesus, the Jews didn't. There's a long, there's a long history of anti-Semitism in the church going way back. Uh, Martin Luther was hugely anti-Semitic. Yeah, he was Catholic. No, he was the first Protestant. <laughs> Constantine. When yeah. He took over, the Jews were hated. Yeah. Yeah. Everything was Jewish was damnful, gummy, awful. That started Constantine, 300 AD. Wow. Uh, yeah, it goes a long way back. So. But why today? Do we, to why are we said that we persecute the Jews? Well, there's still anti Semitism today, and there's, there's uh, anti Islam, there's anti all sorts of stuff out there, and we just got to keep putting out love. There's just no logic to me. So my daughter and son in law live. I agree with you, Roger. There's no logic in it. <laughs> I agree with you. When our daughter and son-in-law lived in Boise, Idaho, it was the Mormons that were always after our son-in-law who's Jewish. Is that they would say some mean things. I read I read a book called There Is No Why. And it was about a satellite camp of Auschwitz where the camp commandant would stand on the balcony of his house in the morning with a rifle. And just shoot somebody, pick somebody out on the ground, just shoot them. Is that any different than today? Who's driving there by is no, There is no I, I can tell you that one of the prayers that I lift up for the Jews is in Psalm 122 that there be peace in Jerusalem so that we might prosper. I shared that with a gentleman. I'm not going to tell you any more than that. And his question to me was, why would you do? Why would you offer up that prayer? Mm -hmm. I know Karen and I a man, a Christian, born full. And I said to him, and he was about 70 years old, I said to him, Have you ever visited Jerusalem? And his response is, Why would I go there? Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is, there are those who believe in post tribulation. In other words, they believe. That we're living in the tribulation right now. Okay. That's what their belief is, not pre tribulation, but post. And they believe because the Jews, 
crucified Christ, he's the right now, the Roman, that um, God walked away from them. Mm -hmm. And like Bill said, that is not true. But there are those who believe it. They stand on it. And why would you go to Jerusalem? Because our Lord and Savior walked and went there. Hello? Karen has suggested I shut up. Chris, we will continue to pray for all who are persecuted throughout our world, and we will continue to pray for peace. We are thankful for the um, negotiations and the truce. Yes, yes. that. Yes. Uh, if I can just quickly uh, give an update on Mia. I yes. Um, yes. heard from her aunt today, and she's home, and she's doing wonderful. Uh, she is free of pain. Uh, she does have a little stiffness, but things seem to be going very well, and the family really appreciates all of our prayers. So, thank you. Thank you, Beth. Let's pray. God, we are so thankful for this group, uh, for the ability to come together and to study your word and to worship you. We are mindful that not all people around this world have that ability, and so we give you thanks for that ability here tonight. We lift up all over our world who are persecuted, who are hated just because of who they are. We ask that you would bring peace and love to the hearts and minds of folks all around our world. We ask that you would bring wisdom and discernment to our leaders and the leaders around the world, that they would lead us in the ways that you have commanded us to be led, that you have commanded our uh, societies to operate, as we read here in Zechariah just this evening, uh, that truth and peace and justice and love would be our operating principles. We ask uh, your special mercies for those who have been mentioned this evening. In particular, we lift up to you Pam, Lois, and Charlotte, and Bud. And we are thankful for Bud's new diagnosis and treatment. We are thankful for Bill's new treatment as well and continue to hold him in prayer. And we are thankful that Mia is doing well after her surgery. We hold her and her family in prayer as well. Uh, we lift up all who, for whom holidays are a difficult time for whatever reason. Uh, help us to be healers in their midst. Now I pray that you would keep all of us safe until we come back together again next week and we lift all these things up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Next week we finish Zechariah and then there's one more to go. We will not be here. Good night. Uh, are you going to Florida? Good night. Uh, Roger and Jane are signed up for next week. Oh, oh. you might as well come over. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.